Sam Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Vadang Dhamang Sanghang Namasami Good to see everybody. Uh, it's also very good to see that uh, nobody immediately got up and left when we did that chant on aging, sickness, and death, and separation. It's like each step is like a, you know, more just laying on the, the bricks. Um, I thought about making a joke that that was like the Buddhist jingle bell rock but uh, didn't want to mention that song before the meditation, because, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, one, one practice which is uh, interesting uh, that you can do in meditation uh, or just in daily life is tracking things back to their source, taking things back to their source and an instance of how you could do this if you're in meditation and you're trying to stay with the breath or a, a feeling in a certain part of the body is when you notice that you're not with that anymore, uh, just actually note where are you, what are you thinking about, and how did you get there? So, okay, you might, I might be thinking about whatever, lunch, and then why am I thinking about lunch? Because I had a particular smell. I smelled something, or I, I saw food, and just tracking thoughts back. And then when you get to that, just that contact point, then it can just bring awareness back to, um, yeah, back to zero, or back to back to one, back to your your object. Say, oh, I just got, I just got pulled along, uh, very systematically from one thought to the next. Um, I had an interesting case of this this week. Um, mm, mm, some people who came to offer alms may have picked up on it, but uh, for some reason I couldn't quite figure out. Uh, towards the latter part of this week, I just started thinking about and found myself talking about wombs, talking about wombs and thinking about wombs, and and I ended up calling my mother. She's a OBGYN, so she's professional uh, at knowing about wombs, um, certainly more than me, and uh, ended up calling her twice uh, to ask about wombs and kind of taking this back, like, what? God, aren't you supposed to be thinking about something else, like not wombs? Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's always funny with my mom, you know, she's being a, a gynecologist, I always sometimes joke with her that, uh, you know, we've got like opposite professions that she's involved with birth and I'm involved with you know putting an end to birth so uh, that's a, a Buddhist joke if you don't get it if it sounds scary don't worry it's it shouldn't be um, but yeah trace back what was it why am I thinking about wombs and um, two streams of thought uh, from earlier in the week uh, one of them being this uh, ongoing book project that I'm doing um, it's a project uh, called Paths to Pamoja, or Paths of Gladness. And I'm tracing every instance in the Pali Canon when the Buddha talks about this whole string of causality, the causality of how from doing one thing, that leads to gladness. And from gladness, that leads to joy, from joy to bodily tranquility, from bodily tranquility to happiness, from happiness to samadhi or mental collectedness to seeing things as they are, to dis dispassion, uh, disenchantment, dispassion, and then liberation. And this sequence of nine things in one place is called the Yoniso Manasikara Mulaka Dhammas, which means those nine dhammas, those nine qualities, which are rooted in Yoniso Manasikara, which literally means turning the mind back to the yoni, turning the mind back to the yoni, and yoni, in English, as in Pali, 
it means the womb. It means the womb. Usually this term yoni soma nasikara is translated as, um, uh, say, skillful awareness, wise attention, um, but it literally means turning attention back to the womb. So I've been uh, really thinking about this, and it's been a big part of my practice. What does that mean, that gladness is rooted in turning the mind back to this, this source? And then just last Sunday, the second stream that got me thinking about, about wombs on this, this topic was just going to Fauntleroy Church, and we sat, a number of us from this community went and to their church service and sang a bunch of Christmas songs, and turns out that in addition to being about Santa and reindeers and presents, that Christmas is about the birth of Christ. So uh, this is the season for, for birth, and that got me thinking about analogs or relationships. What, what is the Buddha's birth story? And uh, yeah, so these things coming together has really coalesced in me. Yeah, finding this, this quite fascinating. Um, so, before getting any more heady, uh, I thought to just invite everyone um, for the rest of this talk, and really, uh, if you're so inclined for the rest of your life or whatever, is really just keeping, hopefully, anyone who is experimenting with it, that during the meditation, uh, bringing the mind lower, just, <laughs> it sometimes feels like we're attached, like there's something that the brain or the mind is just looking out through the eyes. Uh, but we don't have to know from behind the eyes. We can really drop attention. And letting attention drop to lower down, lower through the heart, past the heart, into this, that, that, golden, that golden furnace. And just invite, would it be possible while attending a lecture, while listening to a Dhamma talk, to just stay in this much more embodied more earthy, more grounded space. And what would that be like? Can you receive whatever the teaching is about, almost as if Wi-Fi, the brain, you know, sends the teaching down into the, the lower, lower belly, into this, uh, this yoni area, this, um, this lower place of awareness. So just invite everybody to stay in this space. And uh, this is a, it's not just a new practice, um, it's mentioned in many different cultures. You've got, in Chinese tradition, you've got the Dantian. Uh, this is a uh, Aryan, the Xia Dantian. This is the lower Dantian, or the, um, it's called the Sea of Qi. The Sea of Qi. The Sea of Qi, just bringing attention down there. Um, and knowing from this, uh, elixir of life, this, this area of, of knowing. In Japanese tradition, it's called the hara. Um, in Pali, the belly, this whole region, is actually called the udara. Uh, we chant it in the 32 parts as udaryang, the contents of the, the stomachs. In this word, udara is cognate. Pali is related to, uh, Sanskrit is related to Latin. They're both Proto-Indo-European languages. Udara, can anybody guess what Udara is related to in English? Udders and the uterus, exactly, yeah. So bringing the mind to this lower belly, to this, this yoni space, and letting it, yeah, just, just staying, staying there, and, uh, and knowing, knowing from this, this space. So the quality of yoniso manasikara, or turning the mind back to the yoni, uh, wise attention, skillful attention, thorough awareness, or as uh, my friend Bhante Suhajo will call it, is radical, radical awareness. And like yoni, yoniso manasikara, this radical has the same um, root as radishes and roots. It's literally the radical, that which takes you back to the source. So this radical awareness, wise attention. Um, it's a very, um, 
it's not talked about enough uh, in American Buddhist circles, but it's so primary. It's, it's one of the factors, one of the main four factors of stream entry. So one of the Buddhist, um, basically real insight and awakening stages is brought about through two internal factors and two external factors. The external factors are hearing the voice of another and uh, having good friends. And the internal factors are yoni somanasikara, turning the mind to the yoni, dropping awareness down, wise attention, and practicing the Dhamma in line with the Dhamma. So it's, it's a very important quality. It's often talked about as uh, when you are able to devote this wise attention, yoni somanasikara, you know how to feed wholesome mind states and you know how to uh, not feed unwholesome mind states. So there's a whole sutta called food, basically, nutriment, which talks about uh, turning the attention, using attention wisely, bringing attention back to this source and knowing how to encourage mind states like mindfulness and clear comprehension and uh, rapture and the seven factors of awakening and realizing the source of unwholesome mind states like sensual desire, um, sensual obsession, ill will, uh, restlessness, anxiety, sloth and torpor, and doubt. And you just, you see the source, you see the causality, yoni so manasikara, uh, that which sees causality. Uh, and this is a really extremely important thing to be cultivating both on an intellectual level learning and looking and investigating just mentally, what exactly is it? What, what am I doing with my mind? What was I doing with my mind before I got to this place of being totally overwhelmed with uh, restlessness? What was I doing before I got to this place of just very pure mental spaciousness? What was I doing? Who was I talking to? What was I listening to? What was I doing with the mind? Looking at the causality of your wholesome and unwholesome mind states. Uh, I think another interesting um, relationship, again, with this imagery of the womb, of the belly, um, is a term which you don't find in the Pali tradition, in the Theravada tradition, but is huge in the Mahayana of Tathagata Garbha, Tathagata Garbha. Garbha is another word for womb. And it's literally the womb or the matrix of the, tata, of the Tathagatas, of the awakened ones. And this term Tathagata Garbha is basically, it's not so much about uh, womb as the source, but almost a universal womb. Tathagata Garbha is that expansive Buddha nature Buddha awareness, which is inclusive of everything, inclusive of everything. So womb as the source and womb as everything, Tathagata Garbha, Yoni So Manasikara. Uh, it's fascinating, the language behind these and uh, seeing how they might relate to, relate to one another. So encourage everybody to uh, experiment in this I have found this is not at all a uh, orthodox way of uh, appreciating or understanding this term yoni so manasikara, um, but the physicality of it and the spaciousness of it, of actually knowing from a place deeper in the body, knowing from a center in the body, a centerless center with a circumference, with a surface, that is everywhere. So a sphere with a center that is nowhere and a circumference, a surface that is everywhere. Uh, experimenting with that awareness, this uh, turning of the mind back to that spacious awareness, which is also embodied. Spacious awareness, which is also embodied. And any time why learning poly terms can be great is because Certainly a term like sati or mindfulness, you read it in English and pretty much everybody translates sati as mindfulness. But yoni so manasikara, nobody 
translates it the same. You've got all these different translations. There's even uh, logical knowing or reasoned appreciation of phenomena or some, you know, five, six word long explanation of what this concept means. But if you see, it occurs over and over and over again. Yoni so manasikara, that which turns the mind back to this expansive knowing from a source, knowing from the source, knowing the causality of things. And just seeing, oh, does that, might that fit? Might that be a cause for, for stream entry? Might that be a cause for awakening? So experiment, learn this poly term, yoni. Hopefully you can memorize that, because it's an English word too. Um, yoni, the, the womb, manasikara, mana, is like the English word mind. Manas is, is mind. Kara is like karma, the action of the mind which goes to the yoni. Yoni so manasikara. That second stream of just the Buddha's birth story, um, it's, it's fascinating and it, it points to, uh, say, the what is faith? What is faith in a Buddhist context? What is faith in a Buddhist context? It's very different from how most people, uh, most Christians understand faith in a popular Christian conception is that you either believe in the virgin birth of Jesus and that Jesus was, was God, uh, born to Mary the Virgin, or yeah, that's, that's the basis of faith. And if you ca just can't get your mind around that, then it closes a lot of doors. It might even close the door to, to heaven, uh, the biggest and the best door um, in that system. Um, but in Buddhist context, um, it's a very different system. Faith is a very different thing. And even scripture, so how do you read scripture in a Buddhist context? Fortunately, uh, in a Theravada context, the Pali Canon is awesome and it's so easy to read for modern people. There's just not a lot of religiosity, hocus pocus, hard to get your mind around, superstitious, Mumbo jumbo, um, or at least if it reads, if it seems like there are, and I'm going to mention some places where you might question, like really, really. Um, still, the parts of the canon that you read, like really, did that really happen? Uh, are there really these things? Um, that's not the basis of faith. So I'll just cut to the cut to the chase. The basis of faith in a Buddhist context is this primary awareness of. Uh, an appreciation, a belief that it is possible to cultivate wholesome mind states and it is possible to let go of unwholesome mind states. You've got to take a stance on that. You've got to take a stance on that. You're, you're operating from a, un if you don't have a position on that, that it either is possible or it's not possible, you're unconsciously operating from one of those two assumptions that you either can, you do have agency or you do have uh, action, karma does have fruit or it doesn't, and either life is totally random or you have some influence on the course of, uh, of your life stream. So that's the basis of Buddhist faith. So giving that, you know, cutting that chase, uh, gives some of the wonderful and marvelous uh, situations, uh, occurrences, descriptions of the Buddha's birth scene. So these come up, uh, appropriately enough, in a sutta that's called The Wonderful and the Marvelous. In um, the... Majjhima Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle Link Discourses, Sutta number 123. So in this discourse, um, you've got a group of monks, just, yeah, monks, you know, sitting around like we sometimes do, um, and the monks are talking like, yeah, the Buddha, he's so wonderful and marvelous. He could say in the past there were these other Buddhas, and they had this name, and they did all this, and they did that, and, you know, basically just praising the Buddha as monks we sometimes do when we get together. And then Ananda, the Buddha's main attendant, comes along and he hears this and uh, he says, you're totally, you're totally right. The Buddha is wonderful and marvelous. The Buddha is, he's really, really good. Um, he's just great. He's great. Uh, and then the Buddha comes along and, you know, kind of knocks on the door, doesn't want, totally want to gate crash, um, you know, these monks kind of just talking amongst themselves and left himself in and they all, of course, um, you know, become quiet. And the Buddha says, you probably had some idea, um, but he says, what was the course of talk that you were 
uh, speaking about when I knocked on the door and came in. And Ananda related these stories. He says, uh, Lord, we were talking in this vein. So all of these things, uh, basically the stories around the Buddha's birth, are voiced in the voice of Ananda. So this is not uh, necessarily the Buddha speaking, but he says, I heard this. And he talks about all sorts of wonderful and marvelous uh, situations around the Buddha's birth, like um, the Buddha, when he entered his mother's womb, Maya Gotami was his mother's name. When he entered Maya Gotami's womb, she experienced no pain. Uh, when he entered his mother's womb, she could actually see him in her womb. Uh, when he was born, there was an immeasurable light which went through multiple universe systems. And uh, there's a little interesting kind of cute line that uh, this universal light streamed out through multiple universes, multiple universes, and then even the interstices, the spaces between universes, which are super dark usually, even those got lit up. And it said in the sutta that the beings there, once they could see, they look around and see there are other beings. And this they say in quotes, whoa, I didn't realize there were other people here, <laughs> which is uh, cute. Um, so that's another wonderful and marvelous instance that when the Buddha was born, this light just shined through multiple universes. And the Buddha, he was inside his mother's womb for 10 months exactly. And uh, when he was born, he immediately, he was born to Maya when she was standing up. And when he was born, he was caught by devas, and they presented him to his mother. And then he stood on the ground, and then he walked seven steps, and he looked in the four directions, and he put his finger up, like if you've ever seen some of these statues of a little baby Buddha-like being, with their finger up like this, this is the baby Buddha, when he says this, I am the foremost, I am the supreme, there this is my last birth, there will be no more coming into being. Amazing, yeah, like wonderful and marvelous, wonderful and marvelous. But what do you do? What do you do with stories like this? When you came into Buddhism, because you like to meditate, you know, it's just uh, a whole nother world. you like, I left Christianity because there were all these things I couldn't get down with, so what do I do with stories like this? And so this is one of the reasons I called my mom, is to uh, get some perspective on like, are these things possible? And the reason I called her twice was the first time I called her was to prepare her, just to say, Mom, I'm not gonna ask you these questions tomorrow, but tomorrow I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna ask you some wonderful and marvelous questions that you'll think that your son has completely gone insane about. So please prepare yourself and know that your son is still trying to be rational and hasn't totally drunk the Buddhist Kool-Aid and is still uh, trying to think rightly. So I prepared her, and then the next day I called and said, Mom, is it possible that a woman, you know, is there any instance of people being pregnant having um, a higher threshold for pain? And she said, actually, yeah, there are, there are studies that, that point to that, and there are studies that uh, show, there's one just from 2022, which shows that people who are pregnant in uh, comparison to people, women who aren't pregnant, have more uh, optimism less, uh, yeah, so there's some case studies, which my mom is uh, into, I like as well, scientific studies, science, great, mom, um, I like it. Is it possible that someone could be inside a, their mother's womb for 10 months? And she said, yeah, totally, within normal limits. We say, a woman, you know, keeps a baby usually for 37 to 42 weeks. 40 weeks, 10 months, totally within normal limits. So still in my mom's good books. Um, is it possible that uh, a woman, when they gave birth, uh, could do it standing up? And she said, yeah, you know, usually we don't do that, but it's possible, it could definitely happen. And so I'm still okay with my mom. And then, is it possible, mom, that a baby, once they're born, could stand up, you know, and walk seven steps? 
She's like, no, no, Kobe Love, it's just not gonna happen. I think we've been on the phone for like 20 minutes by then and she's kind of getting you know, fed up and she's like, okay, no, not gonna happen. And then I still had the momentum, so what about, is it possible they could hold their finger up and say, this is my last birth, <laughs> I'm the best of all being. And yeah, that was pretty much, I think the phone call ended like two and a half minutes after that, but um, she still loves me. Um, I still love my mom. But fortunately, we don't have to believe these things. Is it possible? Is it possible? Some of these things are within normal limits. Some of them outside of normal limits. Is it possible that uh, they happened? Maybe. I did watch a YouTube video about uh, a little baby who said, uh, yeah, YouTube video of a four-day-old who says, hello. <laughs> you know, this is a bit more of a stretch. Um, <laughs> I did I hear stories in Thailand about this is actually from Ajahn Pasana talking about a, st a student of his, and he says that she heard that after, when she had a baby, her friend, when, the, when she had a baby, the baby, as soon as it came out, said, Oh no, <laughs> not again. In Thai, in Thai. Oh, see I Something like that. Uh, who knows? Is it possible? Is it also possible that these stories have been elaborated on by, in the words of, uh, you know, a Western scholar, monkish gloss? Is it possible that monks added this in later because they wanted people to think that their Buddha was a god? Totally, totally possible. But <laughs> on one level, you can, it's very easy. Uh, I feel very fortunate, and I think many Western monks and people who come to Buddhism because we come because we see the benefits of Buddhism, of meditation, of these mind trainings on the mind. Training in bringing the, back, the mind back to a simple object, learning how to direct awareness, learning the benefits of generosity and keeping precepts. And you say, oh, there is, a benef there is truth, absolute truth to all these things. I see them in my life. Uh, these other things, yeah, I can say maybe, maybe not. Um, and it doesn't matter that much because I'm starting to have this faith that there is fruit and result to good and bad action. It is possible to abandon unwholesome actions. It is possible to cultivate wholesome actions. So you can read discourses like that. If you come up to something in the text that talk about devas, these heavenly realms, and you don't have to automatically think, if the, even if there's a knee-jerk reaction like, nope, fake, you can say, I'm, that's totally fine, totally fine first reaction. Um, for myself, it's kind of like, it, I don't have this knee-jerk reaction. The suttas, there's, I've had enough interaction with good discourses that it's kind of allowed me to read suttas and say, when I read something that seems too wonderful, too marvelous, I say, okay, maybe, maybe not. I just don't have to pick that up right now. Um, and that's totally fine, because the practice is working for me now. So, yeah, just encourage people to um, approach faith, the faith in awakening, the faith in Budo, this, this knowing. Uh, that's, that's the womb of faith in, uh, in Buddhism, is just awareness, awareness itself, and just it is possible to, uh, to cultivate the mind. And learning about Yoni Somanasikara, the mind which turns back to the Yoni, the mind which is Tathagata Garbha, which is the uh, full awareness of everything, no limits, and yeah, just encourage people to <laughs> experiment with dropping your awareness down uh, lower than just uh, lower than just the brain, because there's a lot of wisdom uh, to be had there. So, leave the talk there and open things up to questions. So we can take questions from people live, or if anyone has any questions on the Zoom chat, you can raise your um, the little hand there so we can see. And we've got a mic here. Um, I think Gary, yeah, Gary has the mic and can pass it to people if you've got questions. 
So Kate? Namaskar, Jan. Um, I'm glad that you are writing a book on Pamoja because I have question on that. And it, it is interesting that you said Pamoja comes first and then we develop the Dharma and then uh, Piti and Sukha because from my understanding from Anapanasti 16 steps, um, Piti and Sukha comes first and then gladdening the mind comes in the third tetrad. Um, and uh, Bhante Anarayo said, um, Pamoja is the happiness deeply within, sort of deeper than the, the joy the joy that happening earlier. So it, it was very interesting to me of how you interpret that. And I mean, I don't understand these things very well, so I um, just want to hear clarification from you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, there are lots of words that have this root mood in them. So you've got mudu, which literally means soft. That's mood, the root means softening. Um, and pamoja means um, like gladness or well-being. The word in the third tetrad of the Anapanasati is abhipamodayang, which is a, a slightly different word. So abhi is taking it to another level. So it's really calming the mind, really calming the mind. Um, so different words also, anumodana, when we say that, that also comes from mudu. It's leaning your softness into others, appreciating other people's goodness, or mudita, this um, delighting in other people's goodness. So in this string that I'm talking about, uh, pamoja always comes, pamojang, pamuditasa piti jayati. So from, for one who experiences pamoja, piti arises, and it comes up like, again and again, like 200 times. And I'm put, so what this, the book will do is pull all of these disparate discourses into one place. Um, but that's the pattern. Yeah, so from Pamoja, gladness, it leads to piti, leads to pasadi, leads to sukha, leads to samadhi. Um, but the precursor to um, gladness or Pamojang is yoniso manasikarato. So for one, turning the mind this is the fascinating part, and to look at for yourself. For one, turning the mind to the yoni, for one, paying attention carefully, paying attention thoroughly, for one, paying attention to the yoni, gladness arises. It's like a natural thing. So experiment with that. Is, is that true? That when you're able to come from this yoni space, that gladness can arise, yeah, in then piti, et cetera. Thank you, Ajahn. What is the Pali word for the the one in the third tetrad again. I, yeah. A bit pamodayang. Okay. A bit pamodayang. Okay, thank yeah. you. And just to say, I think um, Ajahn Kovilo was probably going to bring it around to this as well. Um, but the two streams which he spoke about in terms of the brightening coming back to the source of awareness and then brightening, uh, well, looking to these amazing and marvelous qualities of the Buddha's birth, the Buddha himself in that same sutta uh, brings those two streams together and grounds things in practice. Um, and do you want to speak to that? Okay. Uh, it's, so basically, Venerable Ananda's regaling the Buddha with his own tale of marvelous qualities. And then at the end, the Buddha says, there's one other amazing and marvelous quality of the Tathagata, Venerable Ananda, uh, and Venerable Ananda says, what is that, Lord? And he says, the Tathagata knows feelings as they arise, as they remain, and as they pass away. He knows perceptions as they arise, as they remain, and as they pass away. He knows thoughts as they arise, as they remain, as they pass away. That's the, that's the Buddha's ending of the whole line of wonderful and marvelous qualities is pointing back to just this womb of attention that holds all experience and it's to look back on texts that are 2500 years old and see a teacher with such restraint where his 
disciples are, you know, and yes, these may be hagiographal. There's certainly places in the suttas with later interpolation, et cetera, like Ajahn Kovilo says, we don't have to believe in this. But to watch a teacher rein it all back to the handful of leaves and say, just no, you know, attention in this moment um, is, I mean, what, what a body of teachings we have in that. So I don't know what your mom said about that part completely. <laughs> I'll have to call her again. Yeah. Yeah, but total mic drop on the, the Buddhist part. He just, okay, maybe, maybe so, but boom. Yeah. Um. See, I'm sort of on thin ice here, but I usually am. Um, it, it, it's part of what you were dancing through was sort of what's apparent and what's not apparent, or what may be, or something. And I was wondering, in terms of, um, in sort of on the path, two things sometimes happen. One thing is that crazy stuff emerges in our minds during practice and is like, where'd that come from? You know, that whole phenomena. And then secondly, crazy stuff happens in people's lives. Like, why is this happening? You know, and that whole thing, trying to make sense of it. And so in terms of rebirth, uh, I don't know, but I'm sort of like inclined. But what I guess what I'm asking is, I sometimes use um, like almost the possibility of rebirth or the view of rebirth as a way to sort through those things, even though I don't know it's true, but it's a way to sort through those things, like maybe it comes from some other thing, and just see how that helps sort through it, even though I'm not convinced it's true. You know what I mean? Just as a tool. And I wonder if you could comment on that, because I've, I've sort of danced through that, and I'd like to hear any feedback, if that makes sense. That's great. I mean, what else can you do? You can't force yourself to believe anything. So yeah, using it as a a working hypothesis or a, a possibility is great. One of the reasons that I suggested that we chant that uh, Buddhist Jingle Bell Rock is because one of the lines in there is Kama Sakomi Kama Dayado Kama Yoni Amhi Kama Yoni, which is translated in that chant as I am born from my actions, but it literally means I am, I have Kama as my Yoni, I have Kama as my, my womb. Kama is what leads to birth. Kama comes from this yoni. Kama comes from and is, uh, yeah, there's this relationship. And the, the grammar and syntax actually, um, it can be read both ways. That, uh, yeah, kama gives rise to yoni. So kama gives rise to birth and rebirth. And that's when you follow out the implications of um, kama, in this life, uh, then rebirth is suggested, but it can also be that um, kama has birth as its yoni, or yeah, so we have all these past conditions. I mean, aging, sickness, death, which we talked about, is all precursed by birth and possibly previous births, so um, touching on the subject. Oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, and I think the, in terms of navigating these parts of the teaching which seem extraordinary, when, I mean, this is something that got brought up in the Buddha's time too, and most famously in the Kalama Sutta, where the Buddha comes to a town of Kalamas and they say, there's been many teachers here, they teach all these different things, some teach rebirth, some don't. And instead of saying, you should, I'm the right teacher, you should believe in me, the Buddha, with this characteristic just nuance, says, it is correct that you are in doubt. This is a doubtful matter. And then he goes on to say, what do you think? When you act out of greed, hatred, and delusion, these wholesome states, does it lead to happiness or suffering? And they say, happiness. Wait, no, unhappiness, sorry. <laughs> Let's get this right. <laughs> Clear mountain implodes in one. <laughs> uh, and the opposite. And, and that's very useful, and that's what's quoted often with, like, you know, feel how these 
actions, like Ajahn Kovilo was saying, of, of working with these teachings give you faith over time in your own practice and in the teachings. And then what he says and goes on, and this is the part that's not quoted, is he says, what is praised and censured by the wise. So that's, we don't always have a good internal compass, and we know that. So also referencing what do the wise people say in our lives and, and using that to steer by. And then this third part very often goes, gets looked over, and that's, then he tells them to develop loving kindness. And there's a simplicity to the mind state of love and metta, which is so, it's like a mirror, it's so smooth, that if you stay in that place and ask yourself a question about life from there, it, there's this clarity that emerges. And then finally, he says, basically, this is the double, uh, I believe it's called the double bet, which means you can't for sure say that there is no rebirth. Occam's razor doesn't say we have what we see and there's nothing else. Occam's razor says there is what we see, period. As to what else there is, who knows? So what he's saying is if there is no rebirth, then act well and you'll live a beautiful life. If there is rebirth, which you can't for sure say there's not, then you'll go to a good place of happiness. And there's no downside. Like you said, if you use that as a lens, all it makes you do is take every one of your actions with utmost seriousness. And that's, that just leads to a beauty in the heart that is uh, untouchable. Um, my dad used to tell me that um, there's a philosopher he knew who said, you should live as if today was the last day of your life and as if you, should you would live forever. And I've always thought rebirth held like that gives a strange vision of that somewhat. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I'll just say one other thing is, is um, sometimes when we're caught in angst, it seems like we get caught in a polarized understanding of what we think it is or isn't. And I've developed, I, maybe not faith, confidence. I like the word confidence. I develop confidence that if we keep in practice like boundlessly opening our minds, leaning into whatever it is without any um, definitions, then we thought it was A and B, but it turns out it's, you know, H. Some whole new understanding pops up that, and that's part of the beauty of the practice, is it, is it lets things sort out in ways that we wouldn't see if we thought of it logically or, 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 or within the limited perspective that we now have. So it kind of all fits in with what you were just saying, in a way. Just to note, there's an analogy for that type of insight in the suttas, where the Buddha was caught in the binary of pleasure in the world versus pain and asceticism. And then many of you will know this moment when he thinks back to when he was a child. He sort of tortured himself to starvation. And he thinks back to sitting under this rose apple tree and this moment where he slips into first jhana as a kid and just this voice arises, and it, the first person pronoun is absent from that verse. It's not I thought, it's knowledge, or the question arose, is this the path to, am I afraid of this pleasure? And the answer arose, I am not afraid of that pleasure. Is this the path to awakening? This is the path to awakening. So just how in those deeper moments when the binary is let go of, something else comes from an impersonal place, and how it came from his childhood. There's something about that original tracing back to near the yoni that has that wisdom in it. I think there's a lot there. Sarah? Yeah, I had a little question. You were talking about etymology and uh, mudu, softening. And mudita has been one of the kind of more, it's a, a, I haven't found very many interesting translations of it. And, you know, I was wondering if you could give a little constellation. You know, sometimes it's gladness and other people's joy. Sometimes it's gladness, might be rejoicing. I was wondering if you could how that relates, is that mudita related to mudu, softening? Yeah, great question. I mean, in the chanting book, they translate mudita as gladness. Yeah. Um, and you can conceive of it just as, as joy. I mean, there are many times when it talks about meditators practicing by themselves at the foot of a tree, practicing mudita, 
you know, they're just delighting. It's just joy is coming up, this kind of infinite joy. Um, yeah, it is, uh, all of these mood words are quite useful. There is an English word called compersion, C-O-M-P-E-R-S-I-O-N, hmm. which basically means mudita, but just nobody knows the word compersion. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, mudita is better. Yeah. Is, is it related to softening, mudu? Um, is mudita related? Actually, I don't know the English etymology of compersion, but... Mudita. Yeah, mudita, mudita is definitely related mm. to, it's the same root, yeah, the softening and, okay. um, yeah, how that relates, yeah, softening into others or letting other people, you know, into your, into your heart in a, in a soft, kind of, yeah, okay. soft Thank way. You. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, Zoom, I can't see who that is. Is that Hasa? Hasa Chitta? Okay. Yes, it is. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, speaking of Mudita, I like your new Buddha Rupa. It's growing. It's, uh, it's larger. So as Clear Mountain grows, um, I'm happy. Um, but my question actually, or I don't know if this is a question or a comment or kind of just a, a request for further clarification. Um, it, I, I really appreciate the conversation about doubt and some of these topics and the teachings. I, I recently stumbled across the sutta about cloud devas and the weather that brought a lot of difficulty to me where someone asks the Buddha, well, well, why is there sometimes cold weather and why is there sometimes hot weather? And the Buddha says, oh, it's because there are angels um, rejoicing. And, and for me, this really challenges me because... Um, well, I believe in, you know, high pressure systems and low pressure systems and yada, yada. And so what I was finding was that this was challenging. But I, I could take three different. It, it challenged my view that I held at the time. So um, no matter how I looked at it, I couldn't make it. I couldn't make the view that I was holding at the moment line up with the view that was being presented to me, regardless of how I thought about it. So it could be, oh, well. We just throw this one out, but that doesn't feel respectful to me. Or it was, well, the Buddha was wrong. Well, that doesn't feel quite right either. Um, or there was, well, science is wrong. And that one doesn't work for me either. And so all of the different ways that I could make sense of this didn't work. And what I'm, what I'm finding is that the issue to me is not so much answering the question or solving the problem, but it's that sense that there's an unsolved problem or there's the sense that th things are not lining up perfectly and I need everything to line up perfectly in order for it to be okay, in order to feel fulfilled and content with my religious path. And can you comment on that sort of deeper route to doubt as a mind state? Yeah, doubt, the fifth uh, hindrance is, um, yeah, it can just, there's no way to doubt yourself out of doubt. Um, it just has this um, uh, self-reinforcing quality to it. It's like an echo chamber that the more you kind of allow yourself to doubt, um, then the more it takes over. And whether it's questions about scriptural uh, contexts or or otherwise, um, but yeah, in terms of the scripture, uh, I feel like there is, the Buddha really does explicitly give one a, an out of that whole self-perpetuating doubt feedback loop um, in that he says, oh, I'm just giving the teachings and you don't have to take up these certain ones, um, so yeah, not every situation in life has, you know, an enlightened Buddha giving you clear out that, yeah, you just don't have to, you don't have to believe this. It's not really essential. Um, yeah, pretty much every other instance of doubt really doesn't uh, have that escape. So you have to, yeah, see if you can disengage in other ways. And um, I do find that doubt is a very ethereal and a very, um, it's a very heady 
kind of, it, it'll give you a headache if you indulge in it too much. Um, if you don't learn the, the tools to getting around it, but coming back into the body really can be a, a skillful way. Actually, I want to think about this, and it may, is it this way, is it not this way? Uh, it probably is this way, but then it says somewhere else that it's that way, and, and actually just, um, I'm going to come back to uh, the mind in the heart or in the body. Um, so that's, that's one technique. Did that uh, address all and that a bit, Hasa? Yes, thank you. And and um, again, the the beautiful Buddha Rupa. Yes, yes. And maybe you'll tell us where it came from. Maybe you won't. It was in the attic, and someone gave it to me. No, no, I remember. This is from. Sorry. <laughs> This, when I left Thailand, I asked Long Poranan, my teacher, if we could take a Buddha image, and he let us uh, take this one from Thailand. And I wanted it for Clear Mountain from the beginning, so he blessed it. Okay. We do have to wrap stuff up now. So maybe we could read the blessing braid. For Carol Jane, uh, just recovering from COVID, please send Meta. For Finley Grace, recent passings of father, paternal grandfather, and best friend, and COVID, please send Meta. For Nanette, recovering from a medical procedure, spread care. For Betty Robnett, anniversary of death this week, spread care for a good rebirth wherever she is. For Mary Lee Hartzell, passed last week, please spread loving kindness. For Kyle, Kyle's wife died from cancer, please spend Meta. For Gracie, Ewa's cat, passed away on Tuesday, please send Meta. Do we have other names that people want to bring into the space to hold? Anna, just diagnosed with brain cancer. Dave Arterburn, COVID, traveling, safe recovery. Jeff mother, Jeff's mother, Bonnie, who just died last week. John's father, who died, I think, a month ago. My cousin David died. David, who passed away. Who? Tamira, who's recovering from COVID. Hasa Chitta, who's recovering from uh, some physical problems as well. Who? Marisha Kate. John, John Church, terminal cancer. Luann died of cancer. Darlene, who died of cancer, and her husband Rahul, and daughter Mackenzie. Melanie, who just died of cancer. Gabe, too. So just, I hope people appreciate what it means to bring these names to mind. We forget them so easily and what it means for the importance of cultivating care and just remembering we're practicing for the sake of, you know, bringing a peace to our hearts that we can give to others. So let's hold all those people in our hearts now as we chant. <laughs> 